So we come to this great passage, this great key in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, ten days have passed since Jesus ascended. They're still in the upper room. They're still praying. They're together and something happens. Now, let me just say that, and I don't want to be too controversial here, and I don't want to discourage anybody who may be interpreting the New Testament and the Christian life a little bit different from me, but I am going to say this. There are certain groups of Christians which make a big deal out of the claim that what's happening in their church is exactly what happened in the New Testament. Even exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes these churches look down on other churches who do not make this claim. And they look down in such a way as to say, well, we have the Holy Spirit, but you don't. Or we believe in miracles, but you don't. Or we have the signs, but you don't. Well, let me just say that many things happened on the day of Pentecost. There was a mighty rushing wind which shook the place. Does that happen in these churches? There was fire falling out of the sky. Does that happen? There were people speaking languages that they had never learned to people who had learned those languages. Is that what's happening? Now, I'm not saying that there may be other miracles which involve languages or tongues which are talked about in places like 1 Corinthians. Right now I'm just talking about the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost there were great external miracles which no one could deny that these are mighty miracles. Now I want to say something else. The great confirming proofs of the truth of the Christian faith are public. They take place in public. The fastest growing religion in America is not a Christian religion even though it claims to be. Even though it even puts the name of Jesus Christ in the name of the church, but it's not a Christian church. It's a false cult. And the religion was founded on the doctrine that a man ought to have many, many wives. And the doctrine began in the 1820s in America because one man claimed that an angel secretly appeared to him when he was alone and gave him a magical set of glasses and showed him a prophetic book. It all happened in private. That's how that religion got started. Now, Christianity in its New Testament phase, in terms of the church age, many Christians believe that the church began with Abraham, but let's just say that at least in this phase of the church, it begins on the day of Pentecost. It happens in public. It happens on one of the great festival days, one of the three great feasts of the Jews, which meant that there were tens of thousands of people in Jerusalem on this day. So there were lots of witnesses. Let's say I claim a sign from God, and let's say I say, you know, this sign from God actually came. It came when I was in my room alone last night. How can you ever know for sure? How can you ever believe me? But if I say this sign will come in the middle of the soccer field, 30 seconds before the World Cup Finals begin in South Africa, 
then you will know whether it happened or not because the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching that place. Well, in terms of Israel's great days, this is like the World Cup final. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the day when everybody's in Jerusalem. And on a day when everybody was there and all these thousands of Jews who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire who had come to Jerusalem for the feast day, they felt that wind. They saw that fire. They heard those languages. They knew that the claims were true. Now, let me ask you another question. What if it was all made up? What if it was a lie? What if it didn't happen? Are they going to say that it happened when thousands of people were there if it didn't happen? Don't you think that would have destroyed Christianity just like that? If they made this great, bold, public claim about something when everybody would have known that it wasn't true if it didn't happen. You see how foolish it would have been for Luke to write that if it didn't happen. If I say that something happened and there were no witnesses but me and it was really untrue, no big deal because nobody saw it. But if I saw it, say that something happened in a place where thousands of people were watching and it didn't happen, I've made a big mistake. I've got a big problem. Luke make these, makes these claims. It was on the day of Pentecost. Verse 2, suddenly there came from heaven a noise, a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves and resting, rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to fill with, to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit made them able. Now, I'm not making a judgment on the kind of tongues that people speak in private or the kinds of tongues that certain Christians may speak at church or even the kinds of tongues which were being spoken in Corinth that we learn about in 1 Corinthians. But I am going to say this. On the day of Pentecost, these were known languages. They were known languages. And it was a miracle. In many ways, this is an undoing of the curse at the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel? Genesis chapter 11, where the languages were confused. That was a kind of curse. Well, this is a kind of blessing. This is an undoing of the curse. When people were allowed to communicate in mother tongues, in the heart language of the people who were hearing it, even though they'd never learned those languages. This is a proof. Listen to the message. The message has to be true. It's coming to you in a way that you can understand even coming through people who cannot understand the language themselves. So there were tongues of fire which rested on them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in languages they had not learned. And look at verse 5. There were lots of witnesses. There were godly witnesses. There were Jews living in Jerusalem and devout, who were actually staying in Jerusalem who were devout men from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, the crowd gathered, and they couldn't understand it. And one reason they couldn't understand it is because most of the people speaking in tongues were Galileans. And Galileans were not known for their linguistic ability. I'm a Galilean. The Galileans were country bumpkins. They were people from out in the country who had not been to the right schools. And yet these Galileans were able to communicate in the mother tongues of all these Jews who'd come from throughout the Hellenistic world. And they'd come back to Jerusalem to fulfill their, their feast obligations, their festival obligations. And they asked the question in verse 8, how can they speak our language? 
how can they speak our language? That's the question which must be asked. Some of the languages are mentioned, the Parthians, the Medes, that's present-day Iran, the Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, that's Iraq, Judea and Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, that's Turkey, Phrygia, Pam Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. What can this mean, verse 12? Well, the devil always has an explanation. And the devil sent his messengers among the messengers of God. And um, here was the explanation of the devil. They're drunk. They're drunk. That's why they're talking like this. They're drunk, verse 13. Well, that's very interesting. Um, normally, when a person gets drunk, he's less able to talk his own language. When a person gets drunk, if his mother tongue is English, he doesn't speak English as well as he did before he got drunk. Normally, when a person gets drunk, he doesn't acquire the ability to speak other languages. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty stupid explanation. It's interesting that when Peter stands up to preach, Peter, um, Peter doesn't make the argument that I just made. Peter doesn't say, what do you mean we're drunk? I mean, how do we learn new languages because we're drunk? What kind of argument is that? That's not what Peter says. Peter makes a much more simple argument. He said, people don't get drunk this early in the morning. That's amazing. That's really an amazing answer to the accusation. People say, you're drunk. Peter says, hey, you know people don't get drunk this early in the morning. You know we're not all drunk. Amazing answer. Peter stands up and he says, men of Judah, you who live in Jerusalem, listen to this. Listen to what I'm about to say. This is not drunkenness. This is an instance of the fulfillment of prophecy the prophecy of the prophet Joel. Now, we got to stop here a minute and think about what's going on. Peter is now the main spokesman on the day of Pentecost for Christianity. But remember, Peter denied Christ. Peter denied Christ three times. What's going on here? Well, it's called forgiveness. It's called grace. It's called mercy. Yes, Peter blew it. Yes, Peter failed. Yes, Peter messed up. And yes, Peter gets another chance. Have you ever failed? Have you ever messed up? You ever blown it? You ever let the Lord down? I have many times, many times. God is gracious. God gives Peter another chance. The Lord Jesus gives Peter another chance. Peter doesn't bring to this sermon the same resources he brought to his testimony the night of Jesus' arrest when he had denied him three times. You would have thought that living with Jesus for three years and witnessing all the miracles and hearing all the sermons and having access to all the private conversations and witnessing all the things that are not even reported in the four Gospels would have been enough to make Peter courageous when Jesus was arrested, but it wasn't. You would think that you're studying the Gospels and me studying the Gospels would make us fearless witnesses of Jesus and that when something dangerous happens, we would not be scared, but we would testify boldly with great courage. You would think that, but it's not enough. It's not enough. What's the difference? Why was he afraid in the closing scenes of the Gospels 
when Jesus was arrested? Why was he afraid when he was told, you knew him, didn't you? Weren't you with him? Aren't you from Galilee? And he says, no, 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 I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. He even curses and swears and with an oath denies that he ever knew Jesus of Nazareth. What's the difference now? Is it just because he feels bad? Is it just because he's going to try harder? No. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit gives Peter courage. The Holy Spirit makes Peter stand up where he ran away last time. Now he stands before he fell. Now he's courageous before he was a coward. It's the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot walk with Jesus in Galilee. You and I can't see Jesus baptized in the Jordan. You and I can't eat the bread and the fish while he fed the 5,000. You and I were not born then. That happened in another generation. But even Peter, who had those privileges, was not changed by those privileges in a positive way. It was the Holy Spirit who changed Peter. It was the Holy Spirit who made Peter a great man of God. And you and I have access to that same Holy Spirit that Peter did. You and I can know Christ through the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be changed by the Holy Spirit. We can speak as Christ's witnesses boldly and effectively because of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Peter does on the day of Pentecost. He stands up and he begins to preach. He says what's happening here was actually prophesied in the book of Joel. Joel said that it would happen in the last days. I will send forth my spirit, God said, on all mankind, not just the Jews. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, <clears throat> there comes a time in this passage where the prophet Joel is talking about the things that happened on the day of Pentecost, but then he begins to talk about things that will come when Christ returns. There are some parts of the prophecy of Joel which have taken place. The Spirit will be poured out. The sons and daughters will prophesy. The men will see visions. The old men will dream dreams. But there are some parts of the prophecy which have not happened yet. Blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. That has not happened yet. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. What's the point of all the signs and wonders? Well, the point of the signs and wonders is to bring people to faith which can confess Christ. Verse 21, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words, he says. Verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst. This man, okay, now this is very, very interesting here. First of all, he preaches a message that convicts them of sin 
a message which projects guilt onto them, a message which makes them know that it was their fault that Christ died. Let's ask ourselves this question. How many people crucified Jesus? Well, maybe four, maybe three, maybe five, a few Roman soldiers. But what is the message of the Bible? I think I may have told you during the study of Genesis about this great painting which is in the Alta Pinakothek in Munich. It's a painting by Rembrandt. It's called The Raising of the Cross. And we know about Rembrandt's looks because Rembrandt was very fond of self-portraits. He painted himself many times and his features were very distinctive. He had flaming red hair. And we have pictures of Rembrandt when he's a young boy, and we have pictures of Rembrandt when he's an old man. Probably we know more about Rembrandt's looks than we know about anybody's looks in the 17th century because of all of these self-portraits. In his painting, The Raising of the Cross, he paints the portrait at that moment when the cross is at a 90, is at a 45 degree angle. They're raising the cross up on Golgotha. And Jesus is pinned there with his hands and feet nailed to the, to the cross. And there are people gathered around Jesus, lifting him up on the cross. In the middle of the painting, in the middle of the painting is a man in a green painter's cap with flaming red hair and the face of the artist, the face of Rembrandt. That's Rembrandt's way of saying, I did it. He died for my sin. He died for my guilt. I killed him. I'm guilty. And that's the message that Peter is bringing to them. You did it. You killed him. No, you're not a Roman soldier. No, you didn't use a hammer or a nail, but you killed him. You're guilty. And that's the message that each one of us have to believe if we're ever to be saved. We must know our own guilt as sinners, and we must, and we must embrace our own guilt in connection with the death of Jesus on the cross for sinners. It's time for another break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.